Hey guys, welcome back to day 25, Gibbs Free Energy. Let's dive into this video. And just a reminder that we are looking at thermal dynamics. And this is again how to get heat. We're looking at heat being transferred into useful work. All right, so we're making random chaotic motion into organized motion. Now we know from before heat, heat transferred at constant pressure is enthalpy. And enthalpy is delta H. So we have a function to measure heat transfer at constant pressure. Then we defined entropy. And this is randomness or disorder of a system. It has to do with the dispersal of energy. And as is entropy. Oh, I want to believe. S. So delta S is the change in entropy. And this is basically how energy goes from more useful to less useful. If we're looking at it in terms of heat to work. The question then begins, how our enthalpy which is delta H, and entropy, which is delta S, how are delta H and delta S related? Because they are. Let's take an example. H2 gas plus one half of a mole of O2 gas, making H2O liquid at 25 degrees Celsius, so we're in the standard conditions. That's kind of important. We like we like standard 20 by standard conditions for our examples. And so that technically would be right there, 25 degrees Celsius, right on the arrow. If we go back to our appendix or our CRC or wherever we're going to look up our information, we'll have the standard enthalpies of formation of these compounds. H2, of course, is zero because it's element in standard state. Oxygen is zero. And liquid water is negative 286 kilojoules per mole. The standard entropies, the standard entropies of these compounds for hydrogen, H2 gas, at 25 degrees Celsius, it's 130.7 joules per Kelvin mole. Oxygen. Oxygen, it would be one half of 205.2 joules per mole Kelvin. And water is 70 joules per mole Kelvin, or Kelvin mole, however you want to write it. Calculating delta H of the reaction, our standard. This would equal the sum of delta H F standard of my products minus the sum delta H F standard of my reactants. Plug in our numbers, delta H standard of our reaction would equal products minus the reactant. Our products is negative 286 minus zero. Therefore, our delta H of this reaction, which we also call the heating combustion, is negative 286 kilojoules per mole. So that's how much heat is transferred if you have one mole of hydrogen and half a mole of oxygen burned to make one mole of uh, water. 
Now that's also that's also delta H standard reaction as well. Or system. System. Sorry, system. System reaction, same thing. Now let's look at S. Delta S standard of my reaction or system. Same same thing for our purposes. This will be equal to the sum of the entropies of the products minus the sum of the entropies of the reactants. Same setup, because they're both state functions, right? The, the how we get to the products doesn't matter. It's the fact that we get to the product matters. Plug in our numbers. So delta S standard of our reaction equals our products would be 70 joules per mole Kelvin or Calvin mole minus reactants 130.7 joules per Calvin mole or mole Calvin plus one half of 205.2 joules per Calvin mole which will give us a delta S standard for our reaction of negative 163 joules per Kelvin mole. So for one mole of our reaction, we need, or it's actually negative 160 joules per Kelvin for every one mole. Now we are at 25 degrees Celsius, correct? Which is 298K. Well, if we look at our entropy here, delta S, standard for reaction, is negative 163 joules per Kelvin. We are multiply by 298 Kelvin to give us a total of negative 48,600 joules or 48.6 kilojoules. So at 25 degrees Celsius, we are negative 48.6 kilojoules for one mole of the reaction. Let's recap. We just calculated all this stuff. What does this mean? Let's go back to our reaction. My question to you is, is H2 plus one half O2 going to water at 25 degrees, degrees Celsius? Is that spontaneous? Is this a spontaneous reaction? And a good way to check would be, does this happen without on, without ongoing outside intervention? And what do you think? Now, taking a picture of the globe might help. And why? Why would picture of the Earth help? We have a picture of the Earth here. What do you see on that Earth? I see a lot of blue. What does that blue represent? Well, that blue is going to represent the water. Right? We have a lot more water. And you guys know if we have hydrogen oxygen in the atmosphere and lightning happens, it's going to react and make water. However, all the oceans are not spontaneously going the other way, right? So if it's if it would be non spontaneous in the forward direction, chances are it's spontaneous in the reverse direction. Water is not breaking down into hydrogen and oxygen. In fact, if you could make it to so sunlight breaks down water into hydrogen and oxygen, you have to add something to it. Uh, you would have unlimited fuel. You would. We, we wouldn't have to worry about gasoline anymore. We wouldn't have to worry about, um, you know, carbon emissions. It would just be hydrogen fuel, but we'd have to use sunlight to, to break down the water as we need. We can't do that. So this reaction in the forward direction as written is spontaneous. 
we know all I need to have is a little spark here, a little heat. Heat or spark. And this thing goes. This reaction will happen. And delta H is favorable. Negative delta H means energy's out. It means it's more stable thermodynamically. And boom. Heat out. However, my reaction has a negative entropy. Which means we have a more ordered system. So like this, the system is more ordered. Right? Because we have a negative delta S. Yet, the reaction is spontaneous. Question then is, how is that possible? Our second law of thermodynamics says that the delta S of the universe is equal to the delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. Okay. We know that if this is positive, this is negative, right? Because we know that the universe, when hydrogen and oxygen burn to make water, that the universe becomes less ordered because of spontaneous reaction. We just calculated that it's negative 48.6 kilojoules per mole of the reaction which means that our system is more ordered. Which means the surroundings here, right, must become less ordered. How? How, how do we disorder the surroundings? And that's the question. How do we make these surroundings more disordered? And the answer is heat transfer. From the system to the surroundings. Heat transfer. And so we know delta S of the surroundings would be equal to negative delta H system, a reaction in this case, over the temperature. So in this reaction that we just did, two hundred and 86 kilojoules of heat is produced. And that's delta H standard of my reaction from, from bond breaking and making. It's actually an electron transfer reaction. Now, we're going to have to subtract because 49 kilojoules of heat is required. To create disorder in the surroundings. Which means, if I subtract that, 237 kilojoules of heat remains as quote-unquote 
free energy. And this is the theoretical maximum amount of heat available to do work. So in this exothermic reaction, right, one that produces heat, we're taking a small molecule, smaller molecules, and making a bigger molecule. Two of them making one. We are making the universe more ordered in terms of the reaction. So the reaction is becoming more ordered. However, when we burn, heat is going to be released into the surroundings, and that's going to cause chaos in the surroundings, more just organized motion. So overall, the universe is happy. It became more disordered. And 237 kilojoules of heat remain as free energy. That's what we can harvest. And the formula here, all right, and this we're going to call this Gibbs free energy because Gibbs came up with it. So G equals H minus the temperature times S. Well, what we'll do is we care about the change. So delta G standard of my reaction or system is equal to this change in enthalpy for my reaction minus T delta S of my reaction. That's our that's our uh, rea um, Gibbs free energy equation. So this equation we will be using so now if we look at this if you you know for our second law a quick derivation here if i have delta g system equals delta h system minus t times delta s okay. If I divide everything by negative T, we get delta G system all over negative T equals delta H system over negative T uh, plus delta S system. This happens to be delta S of the surroundings. <laughs> How fun. So delta G, G system over negative T equals delta S surroundings plus delta S system. This happens to be delta S of the universe. So at constant pressure, delta G of my system is equal to negative T delta S of the universe. So if delta G is negative, delta S universe is positive. Let's put that down. Delta G equals negative, then delta S universe is positive. So that's for a spontaneous process. So if delta G is negative, we're going to be spontaneous. So we have delta G and delta G standard here. I want to point something out. Delta G standard and delta G. 
It's the same thing with delta H standard and delta H and delta S standard and delta S. These three right here are at 25 degrees Celsius, one molar, one atmosphere, standard conditions. These ones right here are not at standard conditions. Now, only one thing has to change. It could be at 22 degrees Celsius. It could be at 0.8 atmospheres or 1.2 atmospheres, like whatever it happens to be, 0.1 molar instead of 1 molar. Not standard conditions. They're a different number. So that's the difference. They're still the same concept, just the degree sign means at standard conditions. Delta G, back to delta G, is a state function, just like delta H and delta S, and is an extensive property, which means it matters how much is present. There is something called delta G F standard, which is the standard free energy of formation. The standard free energy of formation. And this is the change in free energy, which again is the uh, theoretical maximum amount of heat available to do work, when one mole of a compound in its standard state forms from its constituent elements in their standard states. So by definition, delta G standard of formation of an element in a standard state is zero, just like delta HF standard. Therefore, for a reaction, delta G, let's make a better delta there, Delta G standard for a reaction or the system will equal the sum of the free change in free energy, the standard free energy uh, formation of products minus the sum of the standard free energy of formation of the reactants. And this should look very, very, very similar. That's, that's how you can calculate for a reaction. And we also have delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So we got two equations for this. Let's talk about the four options here. So obviously if delta G is negative, we're always spontaneous. Well, that means delta H would be negative and delta S would be positive. So it doesn't matter the value 
All right, if I have a positive delta S of my system, and again, this is uh, reaction, reaction, and reaction, or system. So if that's positive, if this is negative, delta G is always going to be negative. Conversely, positive would be non-spontaneous. at all temperatures, which means I would have either a positive delta H, it's an endothermic reaction, and we're making a more ordered reaction. The next two are temp dependent. Okay, so I'm gonna have a negative delta H or a positive delta H. And we're going to have either a negative delta S or a positive delta S. Okay, so let's see. That's a go, that's a go. That's a go, and that's a go. Because the highlighted green helped make delta G negative, if that makes sense to you. So if I have an exothermic reaction, I'm more favorable to make a negative delta G. If I have a more randomized reaction, a more disordered reaction, I'm more favorable to make a negative delta G. All right, so these next two are temperature dependent. So if I have a negative delta H and a negative delta S, right, what drives the reaction? Well, delta H drives the reaction. So this is an enthalpy-driven reaction. It's enthalpy driven, and we're going to be spontaneous. I'll write it on this side. Spontaneous at, well, high T or low T? Well, as T is in this term over here with entropy. So as T gets bigger, this term gets bigger. So as T gets bigger, this negative term becomes bigger. And it's a minus sign, so that's S is negative. So as T becomes bigger, that's a bigger negative number. Eventually, this will be a negative, negative, a positive. This number, T delta S, will get bigger than delta H at some temperature. We don't know what it is, but at some temperature, it will. So it's going to be spontaneous at low temperature. So delta, when delta H is negative, our reactions are spontaneous at low temperatures. At very high temperatures, they stop being spontaneous. That may not actually happen because maybe the molecules will break down at a certain time. I don't know what that temperature is. It could be 5 degrees Celsius. It could be 5,000 degrees Celsius. It could be 5 million degrees Celsius. I don't know what those temperatures are. It's just the principle of it. The next one, the last one, would be entropy driven. Positive, negative. Because right, this term will be a negative term because that's a positive number. And as this delta S gets bigger, it becomes more negative. It overtakes delta H, makes D ne uh, G negative. So now we are spontaneous at high temperatures. It just depends, though. Again, it could be 5 degrees Celsius. It could be 0 degrees Celsius for water. Or 100 degrees Celsius. It just depends on what the temperature is. That's delta G. So now let's do some examples. Starting with number 50, calculate the free energy change for the reaction at 25 degrees Celsius. Is the reaction spontaneous? We're given delta H. We're given our delta H of the reaction. Well, I don't want to write all that. Given delta H. And we're given delta S. I want to point something out here. Delta H's are almost always in kilojoules. And delta S's are in joules. So you just take note of that. I don't care which one you convert. Take note. So delta H, delta S. Do I have an equation with free energy that relates to them? Yes. Delta G of my reaction equals delta H of my reaction minus T delta S of the reaction. 
I think I can plug these numbers in, can't we? So delta G, standard of the reaction, would be equal to delta H, and that is negative 1269.8 kilojoules. Minus T, well, what's T? Oh, T is 25 degrees Celsius, or plus 273 for Kelvin, 298K. Times delta S, and now delta S, I'm going to divide by 1,000 and make it kilojoules, negative 0 0.3646 kilojoules per Kelvin. So I do, chose to do that way. You can make either delta H bigger or delta S smaller. I, it doesn't matter to me what you do. If we do this, delta G is from my reaction. Negative, I got 1161 kilojoules, which means spontaneous. Next one I want to do is 54. In photosynthesis, plants form glucose and oxygen from carbon dioxide and water. Write a balanced equation for photosynthesis and calculate delta H, delta S, and delta G at 25 degrees Celsius. Is photosynthesis spontaneous? Well, well, they form glucose and oxygen from carbon dioxide and water. Well, we know what carbon dioxide is. CO2 gas plus water h2o liquid because we're at 25 degrees celsius so carbon dioxide is a gas water is a liquid uh, glucose c6h12o6 and there's a state there i don't know what that state is we're going to look it up and then uh, oxygen o2 gas at 25 degrees celsius we know that let's balance it then we'll look this up and so I got six carbons, put a six there. We have um, hydrogens, 12, two, I need a six there. Okay, oxygen, six times two is 12 plus six, 18. So I need, uh, what, it's just a six there. So six, six, one, six. All right, now let's look up our values. So we're looking up, I'm in the Pearson E-Tex back matter I want to go to appendix 2 no nope, no nope, nope. we'll back to appendix 2 I want that closed and we got to find so here's our standard thermodynamic quantities for selected substances at 25 degrees Celsius we're going to scroll down we're going to have to find carbon dioxide water oxygen and glucose so carbon dioxide is it in here? Let's look. Oh, glucose. I have glucose. And it's a solid. So I have solid numbers for glucose. There's carbon dioxide gas. Look at those. Let me make sure I have the right ant the numbers down. Yes. And yes, okay. Get to find oh, hydrogen is hydro, there's hydrogen right there. Go down to oxygen. There's O2 and there's H2O liquid. So all our, our numbers are back there. I'm going to write down my delta H numbers. And so for CO2, I get negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. Water was negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. Glucose, and that's a solid, you know, is negative 1273.3 kilojoules per mole. And oxygen, of course, was zero. Yeah, this was a solid because we looked it up. 
standard uh, standard entropies, excuse me, 213.8 joules per Kelvin mole for carbon dioxide, 70 joules per Kelvin mole for water, 212.1 joules per Kelvin mole for glucose, and 205.2 joules per kelvin mole for oxygen so now we got to do just like kind of we did earlier with the hydrogen and oxygen making water got to calculate delta h and then delta s delta h of the reaction would be the sum of the standard enthalpies of formation of products minus the sum standard enthalpies of formation of the reactants Delta H of the reaction will be equal to products. I have negative 1273.3 kilojoules per mole um, plus 6 times 0 minus 6 times negative 393.3 five kilojoules per mole and negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. We have six of these each from the coefficients. That does matter, of course. So adding that up, delta H of this reaction happens to be positive 2,000 802.5 kilojoules per mole. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of heat in to make this reaction proceed. Delta S of the reaction is equal to the sum of the standard entropies of products minus the sum of the standard entropies of the reactants. So delta S of my reaction, products, glucose is 212.1 joules per Kelvin mole, oxygen is 205.2 joules per Kelvin mole, and there are six oxygens. Reactants, there are six of each of we have carbon dioxide at 213.8 joules per Kelvin mole. And water is 70 joules per Kelvin mole. Doing all that math, delta S for my reaction, I get negative 259.5. joules per Kelvin mole. So now if you think back, if I have a positive delta H and a negative delta S, I'm going to have a positive delta G. But let's just do it, just in case. Just in case, and just to see. Delta G standard for my reaction. Equal to delta H of the reaction minus T delta S of the reaction. And just note, kilojoules and joules. Delta G is what we're looking for. Delta G standard of the reaction will be equal to delta H, which is 2,802.5 kilojoules per mole. Minus, and now we're at 25 degrees Celsius, so that's 298 Kelvin. Delta S, and we make that negative 0 0.2595 kilojoules per mole, Kelvin mole. 
So delta G I get two eight eight zero kilojoules per mole positive. So that's very non spontaneous. Which we kind of knew. Carbon dioxide and water are in the atmosphere right now, and they're not making glucose. It's not like it's raining sugar down from, <laughs> from the sky. So that kind of makes sense, and that's just the numbers for it. So that is delta G. In the next video, we're going to talk about the difference between delta G and delta G standard and do some more examples. Take care, guys.